In order to praise God with Selah, you have to be still and stand in awe of the presence of God first. So to praise God correctly, then you must behold God and stand in awe of God. To really give Him the respect that He deserves. And folks, today, in this world that we live in right now with everything that's going on, I think that we all could afford to be still for a minute. And to talk to our God. Let's look in Psalm 46. Uh, we're going to read, we're going to put it on the screen. It's from the Amplified Version. I like the way it, uh, it reads. So we're going to go out of that one today. And y'all have probably heard this uh, scripture before. A couple of weeks ago, we were talking about a man <laughs> named Korah. Korah was in opposition to Moses and Aaron. He wanted to, to take their spot as the high priest in that day. And God did not like being challenged. God appointed Moses and Aaron to be the high priests. And this guy wasn't jiving with what God wanted. So he tried to usurp and remove Moses and Aaron. But instead, God swallowed him up. Caused the earth to open and swallowed him. His house, his family members, but not all of them. Because right here we find that God allowed a remnant of Korah's family to live in order to write this scripture. This is from the sons of Korah. And this was a song that was meant to be sung to everybody. That's why I know that the word Selah right here means be still. See, Selah also means a rest. Like when you get to the end of a verse, you take a pause. That's what Selah means is applied here because this was a song. So they use Selah three times. Y'all, it's like God wrote a sermon and put it in, a, in an outline for us. So that's what we're going to use. Yeah. So if you have your Bibles, let's open them up and look there. I want to give you some context about uh, what was going on around the writer of this song. This was in the time of King Hezekiah in the land of Israel. And Israel was in the south, Judah was to the north, and right up above them was Syria that we have today. The, the Assyrians were coming from the north. Listen now, this is what was going on then. The Assyrians had come into Judah and had captured 146 cities. Then 180,000 troops, that's guys, surrounded the capital city of Jerusalem. Now what's that sound like? It sounds like Ukraine, don't it? The way they come in, they're taking over all the cities, and then they're surrounding the capital. That was the situation upon which this psalm was wrote down. Okay? So he's looking out the window, and he's like, it's done got real out here. This is a stressful situation. Things are not going well out here for our people, for our nation, for our world, because that was the whole world then. And look at what the Bible says. So imagine sitting in, in the temple, in the church, and you just start singing, God is our refuge and strength. Now these songs didn't rhyme. They didn't have to. I don't really know. I mean, they might have rhymed in Hebrew. You know, but I don't sing Hebrew, so I don't know. So count your blessings, right? Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, God is our refuge and strength. A very present help and well-provided help in time of trouble. It says, therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. The mountains tremble. I just, I just, when we go to talk to God, 
to praise God. It is always very helpful to start with to acknowledge who God is. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its roaring, Selah. He's saying, be still and understand. Okay? So we're going to look at three things today, and they all start with the letter P, so it's easy to keep up with. We're going to look at God's promise, we're going to look at God's presence, and we're going to look at God's power. Okay? And I believe that's the natural outline that God gave us right here in the Scripture. God is our refuge and our strength, the very present help in trouble. So, no matter what happens, the Bible is telling us here that we can rest in God's refuge. We can rest in God's strength. So, God is our refuge and our strength, our very present help in time of trouble. And this name for God found in this verse right here, God is our strength. The, the word for God here is Elohim, which means He is our Creator, our Savior, and our King. It gives God the the... Kind of like it paints a picture of He is over everything. He is the authority over everything. Now, the authority over everything is not Putin. It is not anybody else in the world. It ain't Joe Biden. It ain't Donald Trump. It is God Almighty. He is the one over everything who created everything and is in control of everything. Therefore, He can provide us with refuge. He can give us strength. Where are you going to hide when the bombs start dropping? You're going to seek refuge. And God is that refuge. The Bible says so. Do you believe the Bible? Well, then God is your refuge. If you believe the Bible, that means when times are tough, when trouble arises, when you get overwhelmed, when you get stressed and you don't know how this thing is going to go, seek refuge. Jesus said, come unto me all ye who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. I will help you. I am your refuge. Woo! I'm kind of glad that, I'm, I'm actually very glad that there is a refuge. Suppose we had no hope. Suppose we had no, no knowledge of, of how everything is going to go and how it's been. We, we don't have no hope or help from above. There's no prayers. Can you imagine that? We don't have to. We have it. God is our refuge and our strength. He is a very present help. That means He will be here and He will help us. No matter what mess we find ourselves in, God promises to be our refuge, our strength, and our help. So as bad as you make it, God can help you out of it. That, that, that's good news. And there's a very good chance you're going to make a mess of it from time to time. You know... That word refuge has a meaning of fortress. The most fortified building in existence is a fortress. I mean, it's fortified. It's a fort, you know. How I many of y'all built forts when you were kids? It wouldn't have took very much of a bomb to blow that fort up, would it? No. The wind blew, it probably fell. But a fort built by God? is not like the fort that I built in my backyard. That is impenetrable. That means you cannot get in it. You cannot harm what is in it. So if you seek refuge in God, then you will be protected by God. And can't no army rise against that. Psalm 142.5 says, I cry to you, O Lord, I say... You are my refuge. You are my portion in the land of the living. God, you are my refuge. God is our refuge. And you know why I know that? It's because He promised to be. Jesus said that I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you to the end. 
a fort that is easy to find and one that ain't never going to be destroyed is a very good thing when you're in the middle of a war. Right? Amen. So God promises to hide us in His shelter. He said that He can help us by His strength. The Bible says that He is a very present help in times of trouble. Um, ain't you glad you serve a God who comes to your assistance? Who helps you when you need help? It's very good that somebody will help you when you need help and not just leave you to your own. You know, they, they come along, they help you, they give you some insight, some advice, they give you strength. Because when you get to thinking about something too much, you get tired, right? And you overthink it and... Mm. Psalm 9.9 9 says, The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed and a stronghold in times of trouble. So if God will be a, a stronghold for us in times of trouble and stress, and when we are oppressed, then that means that He can rescue us. He can deliver us. So when the sky starts falling on you, God will deliver you. He has promised us that. You know, He has promised that not only to us living in the United States, but to people all over the world. Whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish by a bomb or anything else. Their soul will have an everlasting life. Mm. This word strength that is used here. He can help us by His strength. Um, you can rely on God's strength when you feel weak. It says He's a very present help, which means He will help when you need it. Any of y'all ever heard of a lady named Corey Timboon? Corey Timboo, um, this, this is a quote from her. She said, look within and you'll be depressed. Look without and you'll be distressed. Look to Christ and you'll be at rest. I'm like, now that's pretty. You look inside, you'll be depressed. If you look without, you'll be distressed. But if you look to Christ, you'll be at rest. So what are you looking at? What are you looking at? Looking at me. <laughs> Wisely, I think so. I was. <laughs> I might not now. Oh, man. So, anyway, down in verse 3, it says, Though the waters roar and foam and uh, the mountains uh, quake with their surging, they fall into the sea, the mountains tremble at its swelling. Um, this roaring means that it is a rage. The waters around us are roaring. Now let me tell you something. Every continent is in a commotion right now about what Russia's next move is. There are people wondering what, what they're going to do next. You know, once they get done um, destroying their neighbors and their family and their friends in the Ukraine, I mean, they'll just bomb anybody after that, seems. You know, so what's Russia going to do next? What's China going to do next? They're kind of buddying up with, with the, the psychos, right? So they're, they're all like, yeah, we have like half the world's population and nuclear power. We can just rule the world. Let's try that. And we don't know. And nobody think Hitler was going to get that out of hand when he got out of hand. I mean... People are capable of doing anything when they are separated from God. Because whatever Satan can dream up in his head to get mankind to do, he's dreaming it up and trying to get them to do it. That's what's going on. Well, when the mountains tremble at its swelling, that indicates pride. When something swells like pride, it can get out of hand. And people will start thinking that they have power and authority that they don't really have. And right now, Vladimir Putin, I mean, he's just mad because his last name, right? But he's mad. He's, he's running all over the place. And he, he's, 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 he's swelling. His pride is thinking that he's stronger than he is. We talked about, about Korah a few weeks ago. 
This guy had his pride swell up and he thought he could be the high priest. And God just swallowed him. We have the same God. So, I don't know what you think is going to happen to this guy. Our sense of pride and our sense of invulnerability as a people. Um, you know, when you turn on the news now, it's replaced with stress. It's replaced with worry. Because as gas goes up and everything else goes up, except for your paycheck, you get stressed. Like, how am I going to afford things? How am I going to be able to do things? And, and all right, this is affecting me. Yeah, it affects everybody. This is a world problem. And folks, my God created the world. So, quit freaking out! <laughs> so the psalmist is basically saying, our security is, is suddenly gone um, sometimes in life, and we have to actively search a refuge. And I've told you where it's at. No matter what happens, we can rest in God's promise. Second Chronicles 7.14, y'all know this verse? It says, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. That's a promise! If God's people would pray to Him and put it all in His hands, He will be our refuge! Think about it. That's what Salem means. Think about it. If God is our refuge, even if the whole world is turned upside down, you can run to God. Second is His presence I want us to look at. In verse number 4, He is with you as your resource. It says there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters His voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, our refuge, our high tower. And He says, Selah. All over again. So, in in this part right here, I want us to, to focus on God's presence. You know, God promises that He will shelter us and be our refuge when we seek Him. And we don't got to look very far to find His presence. Uh, verse 4, it's a picture, I mean, it's pretty easy to see. Um, the city of God, what's the city of God? It's Jerusalem, right? It's the city of God, Jerusalem. It was a, Jerusalem is still is a beautiful city, but back in that day, um, it was a little odd, Jerusalem was, because it did not have a river running through it. I mean, you know, there were, there were so many big cities, uh, places, Babylon, you know, they were over in, uh, in Iraq, Babylon was, and they had the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers running down through them. Egypt had the Nile River running down through it. Uh, New Orleans has got the Mississippi. Um, you know, great cities from the past. But there wasn't a city, uh, a river running through uh, Jerusalem, the city of God. And, you know, that, I was like, that makes sense. Because in the new heaven, there will be no water flowing anywhere except from the throne of God. And He will be the living water that floats. He's already supposed to be the living water in His city. That's why they ain't got a river running through it. That's why God didn't settle them on a river. How many times did Jesus in that neighborhood say, I will make it where you will never thirst again? Because it wasn't about the water. It was about the refuge. It was about God giving you what you needed. Well, hey, howdy. Psalm 36, 8 says, They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. God is the one that's going to provide. He's going to give us what we need, right? Right, Psalm 36, 8 says that. I mean, it, it represents happiness, abundance, peace, 
Even when everything's falling apart. Did you laugh this week? You did? So it's not that bad. Even though the world is kind of at war or the beginning and you might be worried and you can't afford to put gas in your car, something like that, you still found something to laugh about. And God just said, you're welcome. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Do you think we could possibly smile or laugh if our God didn't give us peace? You know all that going on over there is going to be all right, don't you? I mean, you do know that, don't you? If you didn't know that, let me tell you, it's going to be all right. That's all. It's going to be. How could you say that? I believe it. If I didn't, if I didn't believe it, I wouldn't say it. God's presence with His people is one of the central truths that we find in the Bible. God being with us. God's presence gives us peace. In the middle of everything falling apart, Matthew one twenty three says that God is with us. By naming Jesus, Emmanuel. Gave Him a name to make sure we would never forget that He's with us. We're going to name Him He's with us. That's what God said. You can just call me, I'm with you. I'm like, I like that name. I'm with you. I like that name. That's what Emmanuel means. All right. What about the title of uh, Most High? That's a pretty good title. So who's higher than the Most High? Hmm? Brooke, who's higher than the Most High? Say nobody. Say it. Come on. Nobody. That's right. Nobody's higher than the Most High because He's the Most High. So, I, so who else are you going to look to? For advice, for strength, for guidance, for encouragement. Who has promised you that they would let you live forever with them, forgive you of your sins, and make you a place to live in forever? Who's promised you that, that can keep that promise? Yeah. God's our presence. Look at the last part of verse number 5. It says, God will help her when morning dawns. No matter how bad things get, God's presence means that He will help us. When we get up to start a new day, wouldn't it be cool if when you got up to start that new day, you, you quoted uh, something that Jeremiah said in Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Because of the great God's great love, because of God's great love, we are not consumed. For His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. What if you said that every day and you believed it in your heart and you knew when I get up today, God is my refuge, God is my strength, He's going to get me through today. God, what you want me to do with this strength you gave me? Because I done got up out of the bed and I, I, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm like, all right then. Look, see how I'm walking? I ain't creasing my shoes. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. What you going to do today? Mm -hmm. But God's going to be with me when I go. He's going to. You going to school today? Or tomorrow you're going to have a hard time with something? Maybe you don't know. It's going to be alright. There's a thing called overwhelmed. And that's what happens when our human brains think about something too much. Overanalyzing overthinking. Anyway, we have a limited thinking capability. Okay, When you overthink something, you will get overwhelmed and overly stressed. Okay, I'm not telling you to not think of anything. I'm just saying, when things start to get out of whack, out of balance and out of line, bring yourself back into balance with the facts that God is with you. He's with us. God is also in the Ukraine right now. He is watching over people. God is also with the Russian soldiers that are dropping bombs. God is everywhere. And He is speaking to people. And He is talking to them. And He is showing His glory and His greatness to everybody. Somebody commits a murder, God's Holy Spirit is convicting that person, saying, this is wrong! 
This is not what I created you to do. People getting saved all over the place. Because of awful things happening. Begs the question, would they do it if wasn't nothing happening? In verse 6, uh, it says the nations rage. The nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms totter. They fall. Um, rage, that's the same word that's used in verse 3 about the, the waters. And when the nations are agitated like the waves of the sea, and they are enraged like they are right now, um, no matter how bad things get, God's still with His people. No matter how much roaring the planet wants to do, God is with us. Amen? Verse 7 says that the Lord of hosts is with us. The Lord Almighty is with us. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold and our strength. He is with us. Uh, the word for the Lord of hosts is Jehovah Sabaoth, which means the Lord of the angel armies. Why would they use the Lord of the angel armies right here? The Lord of the angel armies is with us. The God of Jacob. Do y'all know the history of the Bible? Do y'all know what has happened in the Old Testament? God didn't just love people into obedience. He had to allow things to happen. Because people will take advantage of God. His own people. He had to allow them to go into captivity of the Egyptians before He could free them and make them appreciate Him again. Could it be everything that's happening in our world today has got to happen for the end to come? For the next chapter in Revelation to be fulfilled? Yeah, probably. Probably so. Can God take a bad thing and turn it around? Psalm 24.10 says, Who is He the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. And there's that same Jehovah Sabaoth. He is the King of glory. Okay. The Lord of the armies. The King of the armies. Hmm. God is the King and commander over every, I mean, every army. Earthly, spiritually. He's over all of them. You know, God is in control, right? Exodus 33.14 says, My presence will go with you. And I will give you rest. So God has promised us to be a refuge and He has promised to give us strength wherever we are. Right? Alright. I'm glad y'all are hanging in there. We're about halfway done. But he's on verse 7, eh? But 11. Well, if you think it's halfway or more, let's go. Now, don't miss this. It says, He is the God of Jacob. Jacob was known as a, a deceiver, you know, messing with his brother, stealing the birthright, all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, I mean, this guy, he changed so much, God gave him a new name. Because um, he wasn't always great. But he's the God of Jacob. He's the God of people that he has forgiven. He's the God of people that have made a mess in their life, but they came to him for refuge and strength. I love that they wrote the God of Jacob to remind everybody that's who God is. He'll take you and He'll forgive you and He will like revive you, set you back up. Now, let's look after we pause for our second Selah. All right, now, number three. Let's look at God's power. He is our ruler, right? He is our King, our Lord, our God. Let's look at His power in verse 8. It says, Come, behold the works of the Lord, how He has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. And then He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And then we have our last Selah. According to verse 8, 
we're given an invitation to come. Behold the works of the Lord. Okay? To behold is, is to stand and stare. This is not just look at something. This is to see something. Do you know that what you behold the most is what you become the most? When you're little, you start beholding actions of others and looks of others. And because you put a concerted effort to pay attention to those specific things, you have beheld them and looked at them enough where it has changed who you are. And it's become part of who you are. Sometimes in the past, we behold something that changes us. I know that there's been times in my life where I have uh, beheld the power of God through uh, surprise or um, sometimes even through expectation. I look to God and, and when I see what He has done, I just can't, I just can't stand but to be amazed and in awe. Behold. A whole kind of like saying, Selah. It's like, look, check this out. Another work of the Lord is mentioned here in verse number 9. And it shows us um, in His position as our God. It says, He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Now at that time, the Assyrian army was, was one of the mightiest on earth. Kind of like Russia is today. Um, a very mighty army, affordable, a formidable opponent, if you will. And, and just like Russia's overrun uh, parts of the Ukraine, the Assyrians were overrunning the kingdom of the Israelites and the kingdom of Judah. They were just running all over it. But the Bible says that God had other plans. It says a broken bow is of no value. A shattered spear is no longer effective. A chariot that is lit on fire cannot be driven or ridden in. It's useless. God can destroy the enemy. Period. If God so chooses to. Look at what the Bible says. He is a God of desolation. Okay. It'd be easy for us to, to feel helpless or hopeless um, for somebody that, you know, was not powerful. But you've seen the power of God. You've read about it. Look at this. Look at this. This Old Testament right here. <laughs> tell you what. The Jewish people broke up with God so much. The Old Testament is like a Taylor Swift album. Because it wasn't number break up, get back together. Break up, get back together. Break up, get back together. Don't it sound like Taylor Swift? She didn't even know. <laughs> you know, through the death and the resurrection of Christ, God has defeated the devil. He's defeated our our depravity, our sin. He's defeated. He's, he's defeated death. There's nothing left to fear. Most of the psalm was written in the third person till verse 10. The Lord starts speaking. And what does He say in verse number 10? Pop it on there, Jody. Be still. Listen. The purpose of being still is so that we can know God. In Psalm 37, 5, or 7, Psalm 37, 7, it says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. And then it says, Do not fret yourself, which is worry. Be still and know that I am God. What God wants us to do in order to be 
our promise, our presence, and our power. We have got to behold Him. We've got to be still. We've got to acknowledge Him. What God is capable of doing. God will have no power in your life if you do not believe God has any power. If you do not believe that your prayers will be answered, your prayers won't be answered. If you do not trust in God and surrender to God, you will not find peace with God. Zechariah 2.13 says, Be silent all flesh before the Lord. For He has roused Himself from His holy dwelling. God is here with us. All powerful. In control of all things. If God wants to destroy, He will destroy. If He wants to allow something to be destroyed, He will allow it to be destroyed. Everything working together according to God's will, sometimes is stuff that we can't accept. It's going to be alright. It is very upsetting to see the news and people being displaced, mistreated. But folks, it's nothing new. Ever since human beings started sinning, they've been fighting selfish wars for selfish reasons. A lot of innocent people have died. Millions and millions back in World War II for various reasons died. God's people were hunted. They became a nation after that. And according to our Bible, one generation after Israel becomes a nation, that's what the Bible says, that's when the end of times will be. I like that. You know what that means? How many of y'all were born in 1947? Or around that? Okay. So, at the end of your generation, it's time! Is it getting pretty close? Folks, we do not have to be afraid of the enemy of God. God is stronger. God is going to deliver the people that are supposed to be delivered. God can still work miracles. The last part of verse number 10. It says, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Now let me tell you this. I know of a time when absolutely... Have you been saved? You have, yeah? So, the day that you accepted Christ as your Savior, Brooke, God was exalted here because you chose Him. There is coming a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord. Every single one that has ever existed. He says, be still and know that I am God. I'm in control. And also, there's coming a time I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted on the earth. You've already exalted Jesus with your decision to follow Him. So have you, right? So have you. He will be exalted even by His enemies one day. And that day's coming. It'll be right before they are told to go to hell, be permanently separated from God, and then wiped from memory. I mean, Jesus said, depart from me as, as though I never knew you. How could Jesus possibly never know you? By making you not exist anymore. In His mind. He will wipe you from memory. And that is how there will be no more tears in heaven because after that, it says He wiped their tears away. So you and I are going to be crying over all the people that are lost that we did not exalt God enough in front of while we were here. This world is raging. 
The Bible says so. It was raging then. It's raging now. And we, we us, we have a responsibility to the world to let God's glory be a part of our lives. To show people that we have faith in God. And that we are not worried or overwhelmed or overcome by the evil that's in this world. Instead, we know where there is a refuge. We know where we get our strength from. We know where our power comes from. It comes from above. God, the Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, the One who has created me in His image, so I know what I'm capable of because of His power in my life. I can do anything that He wants. Or I could just mess it all up. I could start stressing and worrying. I could not exalt God. You've been stressed and worried. You've got friends and family that all they can do is gripe about the world right now. Well, maybe that's you. I think God sent me in today to tell you, stop worrying. It's going to be all right. Jesus Christ has made a way that we can live forever with Him. And there ain't a person or an army on this world and take that away. So let's live like it. If you've never trusted Christ, accept Him as your Savior. And if you've been struggling by not putting Him where He's supposed to be, exalt Him today. You're going to feel His presence and you're going to feel His power. It's great. Let's all stand. If you want to pray now, it's the time to do something.